Sigmar Stone um, is on the southern edge of the medieval town of uh, Nottingham. Uh, it was a very important uh, part of the medieval urban landscape. Uh, the name is telling you something about its location. It's down uh, um, uh, at the southern edge of the cliff face um, uh, of the, the sandstone rock uh, on which Nottingham is, is built and runs along the banks of the River Lean. It was a very important area for medieval industry, um, uh, including tanning, um, and then became, over the course of the 18th and 19th century, uh, a slum area of, uh, of Nottingham in the city centre. Uh, it was then cleared by the city council in the uh, 1970s for the construction of the um, uh, Super Duper Broadmar Shopping Centre. Um, the, um, there's the site. In terms of the, the heritage of the area, um, photographs of, of the streets um, in that part of, of, of Nottingham, including uh, Drury Hill, which led down from the, from the market uh, uh, square down to the river valley, show uh, this was a, a densely occupied urban neighbourhood full of um, medieval timber frame buildings. Um, looks very much like the shambles in York um, that was all swept away by the city council. There is a long memory uh, among the people of Nottingham of loss um, for this part of, of Nottingham city landscape and, and quite a lot of lingering resentment um, at the way in which urban developers and the city council in the 1970s acted um, in, 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 in sweeping away something that was, was quite distinctive and unique to the city. At the same time, there's also quite a lot of fondness for the old Broadmar shopping centre. It is where people went with their grand to go to British home stores and where they went for their first date to the Wimpy. So this is a, a part of Nottingham which has, you know, um, deep resonances with the people of, of, of the city. Um, uh, in terms of the below-ground archaeology, of course, um, uh, Nottingham has this unique phenomenon of its cave heritage. Um, uh, and uh, again, the caves that you visited yesterday underneath the Broadmar Shopping, underneath what was the Broadmar Shopping Centre, part of the City of Caves visitor attraction, um, are some of the best preserved. But there um, are hundreds of caves underneath the city, and we know of many more. There were probably... Uh, estimates vary 800 or 1,000 caves underneath the city centre um, that, that, that are known about. Um, and they are an incredibly complex, fascinating, varied and challenging form of archaeology to work with. So um, there's many of them go back to the medieval period. And uh, um, in the example that you saw yesterday, those of you on the tour, we have medieval tanning pits. Um, in many of the caves, many of them, um, um, over 30 or 40 uh, med uh, medieval malt kilns uh, dug into the rocks at underground maltings for beer. Um, and then they go all the way through. We've got 18th century drinking dens uh, underneath posh townhouses. We've got Victorian follies carved with classical mythology. Uh, and then uh, we've got houses, uh, people were living in the caves right through to the um, early 20th century, and um, many of them were used as air raid shelters in World War II. So there is a, a, a thousand year history there. Uh, and the Broadmarsh is also a really rich archaeological zone. So we have uh, on Drury Hill, we have the original Anglo-Saxon defences of the, of the Anglo-Scandinavian Burr that was constructed on, on top of the cliff. So that is an Anglo-Saxon urban ditch, um, very impressive feature. Um, excavations in the Broadmoor Zone are revealing, as I've said, evidence of medieval industry. The medieval friary was there, so we've got medieval, a medieval cemetery. There's also um, a post-medieval workhouse and a, a parish and pauper cemetery from the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, this is the current state of the Broadmarsh. Um, uh, it was in the process of redevelopment in 2020 when uh, into the, the owner uh, of the Broadmarsh uh, went bust. Um, so you may remember that. Um, and handed back the half-demolished shopping centre to the city council um, uh, for them to do something with it. Um, so this is currently the largest urban regeneration project in Europe. 
uh, taking into account not just the shopping centre but the wider zone, um, which has been redeveloped at the same time. Um, there are um, uh, there are bids going into government at the moment for levelling up funds um, to um, uh, help redevelop the site. And um, a vision has been produced by Heatherwood Studios for what will happen to this um, uh, whole southern quarter of the city of Nottingham. And um, uh, I encourage you to have a look at it online. It's uh, an incredibly radical piece of urban design. The plan uh, is to keep the frame of the shopping centre, um, creating almost a new archaeological monument in the city of Nottingham, which will be a zone for small businesses, cultural activities, pop-up shops, um, and, and all different kinds of things. And then the wider redevelopment zone has a lot of green space, which is something that the citizens really uh, asked for in, in the redevelopment, um, as well as mixed residential and business uh, uses. Um, our project is then aiming to use the resources of the university and its academics uh, so I'm a specialist in medieval archaeology and uh, urban buildings. Um, we have a large number of, of academics in the departments of history and archaeology and English who work on um, urban records, um, urban archives, urban archaeology, um, material culture, human remains. There's a, there's a, there's a, a sort of um, a, a, an academic resource there that we want to use to... Uh, help inform what happens to the site and the wider development of the city's caves heritage, which um, are um, hugely valued by the people of Nottingham if they know about them. And I think there's a general sense that they're an, an underdeveloped, underused, not so known about by the wider public as they could be. Um, so our project in, in brief is about working with all of these different partners, with the city archaeologist, Scott, who you met yesterday, with the city council, um, with the National Justice Museum, who operate the City of Caves attraction, um, to develop a research agenda for the caves so that we can better understand them. Um, there's also challenges around their conservation and preservation and management, uh, so we need more environmental monitoring, for instance. Um, uh, and then trying to take all of our academic knowledge and our work with the collections and with the volunteers to then um, help to develop that City of Caves attraction within the new redevelopment. There will be some new, I um, can't say too much about it at the moment, there will be a new museum entrance. There will potentially be quite a large amount of display space planned um, for the City of Caves to really tell these, these narratives and stories. So that's what we're doing. And now I want to hand over to my colleague Charlotte, who can tell you a bit more about what we're doing for the collections. Thank you, Chris. And it's been um, my role on the project is as Knowledge Exchange Fellow. So that very much is about collecting the knowledge that we've got so far looking at data, looking at those kind of pockets of knowledge that we've got within the city. Like Chris mentioned, there is a huge legacy here for the caves. They mean a lot to the people of the city. And that's really central to everything that I've uncovered so far. I mean, don't get me wrong, we've got myths from Roman centurions in basements, um, satanic cults. Um, but we've also got this amazing myth that you could walk into one cave and end up at the other end of the city, which is complete nonsense. But people could spare on their life that they've done it. Um, so we're working with this absolutely amazing kind of myth um, mythical but also very emotional kind of historic site that is at the centre of Nottingham. Um, so it's been a real privilege to work on this project. By background, I'm a literary historian, so um, I'm all about the paper. So I can find anything, that's my mission. Um, and actually, one of the really fascinating things with the city of Caves is actually when we look at the archival evidence and what is currently existing and written, it's kind of trying to put that back together and work out where these stories come from and how caves are historically referenced. So the co-I on the project with Chris and um, Richard Goddard, he's from history, and he's been work working a lot on medieval 
um, records relating to Nottingham. Um, you wouldn't be surprised by how many words there are for cave. Um, anything from kind of rock hole, vault. Um, there's lots of, again, myths about um, troglodyte caves, and there's hermit caves. Um, there's lots of things that are often put with the word caves at the end, um, which may or may not be caves. Um, so, without going too far into an existential crisis about what is and what is not a cave, um, actually it's been really fascinating to again kind of look at the representation of these caves in historical documentation. And that brings us really through the medieval period onwards, and I've actually spent a lot of time kind of going to archives, trying to look at material that is currently catalogued. Um, and as we all know, the catalogued and the uncatalogued um, are two very different things that we have to work with and manage within these projects. But actually looking through maybe some more unexpected documentation, um, such as the St. Peter's Vestry Meeting Minutes, which I happened upon by sheer chance, we know that the Boardmarsh redevelopment was within St. Peter's Parish, and absolutely the parish infrastructure and administration is really central in governing land use. And um, so we're actually really, really keen on looking at things that might not have been traditionally maybe involved in putting together narratives about caves. So when we're thinking about the city of caves, um, I really need to say that we have an amazing group of stakeholders who are our friends in many ways. Um, Anya Roda, who is here, um, her amazing 2017 report, which is a work of art, Anya, I've mentioned it, but it is, um, brought together a lot of the collections about the caves that exist in the University of Nottingham Museum, as well as um, Nottingham um, City Museums and Galleries, which includes the castle at the moment. Um, so there's a lot of kind of um, movement of um, collections as well within there, because I will mention that there's been huge redevelopment at the castle over the last 40 years, um, and actually there's been a very much a focus on interpreting Nottingham as a city of rebels, which is very much something I believe it is. Um, they have a very good history of burning things down, the people of Nottingham, which I adore. Um, and again, kind of looking at the caves as places of refuge and places where stories of characters can really come to life, um, including Robin Hood, who is totally real. Um, so there's these amazing stories there, I could go on forever. Um, but, so Anya did a really fantastic report that brought together a lot of the information across the collections and also the phenomenal Claire Pickersgill um, at the University of Nottingham is the museum keeper, who, um, you, who as you can um, tell from yesterday has been working a lot on kind of bringing the caves into the collection and displaying them here. So as well as unaccessioned material, which is inevitable in any collection when we're thinking about the local societies who work on the and have done a lot of the rescue excavations when we were thinking about the archaeology that needed to be undertaken when the city was redeveloped in the 60s and 70s. There's also the case where actually with caves it can be very difficult to know where things were found, when they were retrieved from backfill, or when they were found in how do I say, adverse circumstances. <laughs> so when they were accidentally found, I mean, Scott mentioned yesterday that there was a moment where actually uh, a visitor leaned back on the wall in the caves and found um, some gold coins. Apparently it does happen. So you can find as well in the museum galleries, there is a case which does have finds from the caves as well. So please do have a look. And it's also got a laser scan of a particularly beautiful mural that is under one of the private houses in the park. The park is an 1870s um, stunning late Victorian development in Nottingham. Um, what I will say is that one of the issues we work with, and I say issues, but actually it's a, it's a challenge that's afforded us a lot of opportunities, but the number of caves which are privately owned. So we're not just working with the stakeholders like the City Council. Actually, inevitably in this project, we are also going to be working with stakeholders who are pubs. Yep, that's a thing. We are going to be formally working with, you know, thinking about how pubs use their cellars and how they actually use the sometimes medieval as well as post-medieval cave spaces, but also the private homes, which actually have those amazing drinking dens and those really incredible murals. There are a lot of biblical themes as well integrated in those. So a real eclectic um, mix of caves, as, as Chris said. So who has the archaeological finds then? So the Nottingham City Museums and Galleries, the National Justice Museum, some of their um, cells, um, well, not just caves, so they've got a subterranean, um, well, they've got at least two, I think, subterranean levels in there. Um, we've got some at the University of Nottingham Museum, the Nottingham Historical and Archaeological Society, and they are a local group of volunteers who've been running 
for 40 years um, at least, maybe maybe 60 years, a long time. Um, and also with our um, one of our partners in this project, York Archaeology, as well. So it's been really exciting to have that range of stakeholders involved in um, kind of telling us what they've got um, and how it can inform our project. What are the archaeological finds? So ceramics, metal, stoneware, and glassware. It was actually kind of hard when I was thinking, well, what isn't in there, really? If you're thinking about what caves were used for as storage and how inevitably these kind of subterranean cavities get filled with stuff, there's going to be a bit of everything in there. So we've got domestic items, um, jugs, cooking pots, bowls, bottles, um, and lots of items dating from the me early medieval period onwards. Um, so you'll have noticed yesterday, for example, the tanneries, you know, the idea of things built into the caves, um, but actually there are lots of things that were put into the caves, and that's something that will obviously help us date the caves and recognise their uses, as well as bring back the stories about the people of Nottingham, which is very much one of the things that's been um, so enlightening, I'll be honest, about this project. Um, I th I've always loved this city, but I love it even more now. Um, so here are some of the images of finds from the cave. So um, we have here, this is from York Archaeology, so this is the glassware. Um, and this was found under the, um, what was an inn, next to now what is the Justice Museum, in a field in well, um, and that's 17th century, so looking at that glassware. The reason that we are also looking a little bit more holistically at caves and not just broad marsh is because actually it's a city of caves. Looking at the other caves and cave finds informs the caves under the broad marsh, but also helps us to connect to the wider histories of Nottingham. So on the um, this picture as well, and I noticed I think we've got a competition here for like best slash worst boxes things are stored in. Um, I'm sure the Nottingham Archaeological Society has some great submissions because, again, they have been doing a lot of rescue archaeology and having to work with what they've got when they can. And it's been a brilliant effort. And I think actually in their basement, which is where they store so much, they are currently at the point where they are cataloging. And we're obviously assisting them to do that as well. Um, so these are some of their finds. And they have open days where they invite people into the basement to have a look at what they've acquired over the years. Um, and there's some really, really incredible stuff there. Um, and I think it's one of those realities as well where they've just got so much. And it was wonderful to hear yesterday about other archaeological collections in similar positions, actually, when you go through the boxes and you're not quite sure what you're going to find. So that brings me on to the final point, point about um, community liaison and engagement. So we're really lucky. We have Anna Vallas, who is one of our community liaison officers for the project, and she's done some amazing work. And um, we've got the Being Human Festival coming up, which is where we're going to put on a lot of events about the caves. Um, you can find out about this online, and there'll be things on our Twitter from next week. Um, but it's really important. Lot, and, and as Dot was saying, and you know, everyone yesterday, but we centre communities and we co-collaborate. Um, we're not just doing things for them; we're doing things with them. They co-create our outcomes. Um, so working with key local heritage organisations and community groups. A program of public engagement, so that includes digital as well. I think when we think about access and caves, we do want to make sure that people have the experience of being there if they can. But access isn't always physical, and we need to make sure that we're seeing access as a really holistic and creative experience for people to engage in. Um, and we want to celebrate cave heritage. It's something that, you know, with the Broadmarsh development, again, there is a lot of, there can be a lot of negative feelings here. It does feel for people that they're, they're missing out on something they might have had without Broadmarsh. And then with Broadmarsh gone, they're missing out on that part of their histories as well. So actually, it's really important that we celebrate the caves and look at the heritage of the city as something that people can really relate to and be proud of. We want to make sure that public awareness is there so that people know about the caves and, you know, as Scott said yesterday, we don't think any houses are going to fall down caves, um, but in the past, I think he said a lorry has. You know, but it's very unlikely that someone's going to fall down a hole. Um, but again, we want to make sure that people are aware that actually it's not just um, look around you. There, is, uh, there have been various campaigns in the past to say, look up Nottingham, so the idea of looking at our amazing architecture, including Watson and Fothergill, um, but also look down as well. So making sure people, you know, understand that the area they're in is full of stories. So we also want to work on the development of heritage sector skills and employment as well. So something that um, I'll be putting on in a few weeks is a manuscript workshop so that people can look at maps and look at um, paper documentation relating to the caves 
and their city. And again, that's something that some people feel quite intimidated by if you've not worked with those items before. And I know that before I worked in museums, I was quite intimidated by archaeological collections. And it's only by, you know, sort of rummaging through the stores or giving myself that time to familiarise myself that I became comfortable, confident, and could add that to my expertise. And we're aiming to do the same with these community groups as well. We've gone from the kind of era of rescue archaeology, and now we're kind of looking at how we can embed infrastructure and training into those who have the interest and the enthusiasm for archaeology, which is something we've seen in bucket loads. So, I think that's pretty much everything that we wanted to cover. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And it's been brilliant yesterday as well when we were going through the caves. I was listening into conversations and what people were saying. And it's been really wonderful to have this forum to actually, um, you know, find out more about how you felt in the caves. You know, what really struck you. I know lots of, lots of people said they weren't aware that they'd seen her caves. But we're really, really keen in the scope of the project to kind of, you know, think about the potential. And it's really, really exciting um, to do that with you all as well, so thank you very much.